inviting you to come for this conference and hear. How can we experience and foster a culture and a practice of this? Good morning, church. So good to see you, and for those of us joining us online, we're so glad that you could make it to worship with us this morning. I want to invite us to stand first today, and I'm very excited. I know our team is very excited because today is our first Sunday of Global Mission Conference. Are you excited, church? Yes. And we have a very special guest joining us uh, for our conference, and each week we're going to see mission partners from around the, around the world joining us to be a part of our services, and today we have Daniel here, so can we give him a warm welcome as he gives us a call to worship? Hello friends, hola amigos, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you uh, this morning. Uh, I extend warm greetings from a country named Colombia. My name is Daniel Bravo, and I have the privilege to serve there along with my family. And I'm the executive director of a Christian NGO called Fundacion Dulos, but also I have the privilege of coordinating a national movement of local churches that are committed to uh, bring the good news of the gospel in an integral way to uh, the places where the need is greater. And I want you all to know that uh, I value this time over here because you are part of that movement as people church. So it's a privilege for me to be standing here today. And as we gather together, I would like to read a passage from Scripture that is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. And I will do that in Spanish, of course. I read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Leemos en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo. Hay un solo cuerpo y un solo Espíritu así como también fueron llamados a una sola esperanza. Un solo Señor, una sola fe, un solo bautismo, un solo Dios y Padre de todos, que está sobre todos, por medio de todos y en todos. Now as we reflect on this passage with our hearts and our minds, let's worship the Lord together. Thank, yes, thank you, Daniel, for that. We're going to start off, church, by singing a new song. We're going to teach you. If you were here on Friday, you might have sang it with us. But we're going we're gonna to get loose a little bit this morning. Right? You guys ready to do that and lift up the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Are you ready? Let's go. Hey, put your hands together. Come on. Thank you. 
like our God. Can we pray together, church? Lord, we thank you for your goodness. And we're reminded today, God, there's no one like you. You are the name that is above every name. And your name is strength, power. And in your name, we believe healing and transformation can happen. And we know that each of us, we need work to be done in our own hearts as well every day. And God, you are the God who we trust and believe in. And so we want to continue to worship who you are and all that you've done for us. All of you, everyone in the church said, amen. Let's continue to worship him this morning.
the name above every name There is no one like you There is no one like you Give you all the praise, God. You are the name above every name. You are the name above every name. mighty and we as a community we declare that out to you 
that there you are the name above all names and worthy to be praised today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear more of you and draw us closer to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. serve a mighty God. And we have been looking to him as we sing our praises, give him our worship. But the Bible tells us that we're to love God with all our hearts and souls and mind and strength. And then it goes on to say, and love your neighbors as yourself. So we've gathered together both here in this place and online today. We've gathered together to worship him. So I'm going to invite those who are worshiping here to turn to someone else, someone that they don't know, and just offer them peace in the name of Jesus. And if you're online, I'm gonna invite you to just enter a blessing into the chat so that you can bless those who are watching online as well. So turn now to your neighbors and just offer them a blessing, a welcome in the name of Jesus. Throughout these next three weeks together, we're not only going to have really wonderful opportunities to connect with one another, but we are also going to have among us our guests, our international partners like Daniel and many others. So please take an opportunity to meet them, to hear their stories, and to offer your blessing to them as they come and they worship here in person. If you are here for the very first time and you're thinking, wow, what is happening? We're gonna encourage you after our time of teaching to head into our Connection Center and speak to someone there and they're gonna be able to tell you all the wonderful ways that you can get connected here at the church. A really important part of our worship is our giving. This is the way that God gives us to participate in what he's doing here at the church and around the world. It's an act of worship, friends, because we're taking gifts that God has given us and we are saying, thank you. And we are saying, we trust you, God. And we are saying, please, make me more like you in your generosity. So if you've come with your gifts today, we're gonna encourage you to just leave them in the special containers in the foyer. If you give online, it's very, very simple. You just need to text at the church number 416-222-3341 and just text the word give. And it's gonna show you how to do that. But what is very, very important, no matter how you're giving, that you make it an act of prayer and worship. That's what this is. It's an act that comes from your heart as it connects with the heart of our generous, loving, and giving God. And during Mission Conference, we're actually invited into another way of giving, another way of expressing God's generosity in the world. We call this Faith Promise. And I'm gonna invite you to watch the video as we understand what it is we're being invited to be part of. give because we are committed to actively sharing the good news of Jesus with people everywhere, from right outside our very own doorsteps to communities all around the world. Because we give, orphaned Lebanese, Syrian, and Palestinian girls find God-giving beauty and a loving home. Young adults from Brazilian churches travel to bring the good news to people living on the Amazon River. Because we give, couples in Bangladesh are equipped and living out God's transformation through their preschools, sanitation education, and savings groups. 
and indigenous Jesus followers in Alberta are hearing biblical storytelling and music over the air. We give to Global Mission so our partners can respond to needs in their communities in life-giving ways so that unjust systems can be transformed and relationships restored. We give to Global Mission so that the gospel can be shared in love. And because we give, students at the University of Toronto are talking about science, culture, and the meaning of life. And young leaders in Central Asia are trained and mobilized to be salt and light in their workplaces. Because we give, a youth development center in Nigeria now uses solar energy to supplement non-renewable and inconsistent power. And the People's House now provides three places of safety, community and hope to refugees arriving in Toronto. Because we are committed to God's global mission, communities are being transformed, lives are being changed, and people are introduced to the love of Jesus. One of the key ways we express God's calling to share the love of Jesus to everyone everywhere is by investing our personal finances in global mission partnerships through our Faith Promise commitment. Faith Promise is so much more than just a financial commitment. It's an intentional act of faith. It's a promise between each of us and God. It's about making global mission an additional and consistent budget line that reflects its significance in our lives. To be clear, this doesn't mean redirecting our regular tithes and offerings. This is an additional offering. Faith Promise is about posturing our hearts and our financial decisions to reflect God's kingdom priorities. Making a Faith Promise is simple. First, ask the Holy Spirit to help you discern the amount. Second, trust God to provide the funds. And lastly, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to faithfully give. As you pray and ask God about how he is calling you to make your faith promise, please visit thepeopleschurch.ca to learn more about our mission priorities and read stories from our global partners. Let's continue to grow the body of Christ for God's global mission. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and ask the Holy Spirit to bring one of those images back, one of those images that you just saw in the video. Right now, our partners are praying to God in faith that he will provide. Right now, he is moving in our midst to connect our hearts with those prayers. Father God, you hear the prayers of your people. You are provider, God. And you can provide any way you choose. And yet, Lord, you include us. You give us the joy of being part of your answered prayers for your people. Keep our hearts tender, compassionate, generous, and faithful so that we too can hear the prayers of your people and be ready to share in love just as you have shared in love with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, sitting in our midst, we have our junior youth. If you guys can just stand up. They're going to head out to their teaching time. They've been participating in worship with us. And as they head out, we are going to prepare our hearts for our teaching time. There was a young boy who was born in Ghana. He soon became an orphan and was taken in by an uncle 
who had no use for him, no time for him. The boy's name was Kovana, which means born on Tuesday. This boy found the love of Jesus. He discovered a God who sees him, who sees each one of us. And as scripture tells us, if we humble ourselves before God, he will lift us up. Young Kovana humbled himself before God. And interestingly enough, before his father died, he gave his son the name Daoud, David. Although he had no idea of the blessing that came with this name, the blessing of a young man who humbled himself before God and was lifted up to become a leader of his people. And so today, we welcome as our teacher, Dr. David Mensa, who has, through his faithful, obedient trust in the God who sees him, lived a life of obedience, and God has lifted him up to be a leader of his people. Through his faithful ministry, many have heard about the love and the provision of a Savior God. Through his ministry, a hospital has been built that serves hundreds and hundreds of people in his country of Ghana. Through his ministry, chiefs, tribal chiefs, leaders in the country of Ghana have found peace in their own hearts and peace with one another. It is from this rich, rich life of obedience that Dr. David Mensa comes to us today and will share from God's word. So let's welcome him as he comes now. It is always good to be here. I want to thank my brother, Pastor Brett, and Sister Sandra for bringing me back here again uh, to share with you. I come from Ghana, as he said, um, just really looking forward to be here. This is my second time, and any time I come here and look at you, you, you just look like the one that is described in the book of Revelations, that at the end of time, that there will be all cultures. There will be the black people, there will be the red people, there will be the blue people, there will be the yellow people, there will be all the colors that will be there. And it is so signified here that when you come here, you see those faces. That is so real. We praise God that he has made us the way he has made us. Today is the day of Pentecost. I don't know whether you know that. Some of you have forgotten. But, <laughs> but it's the day of Pentecost. The word of God is based on obedience. Right from the end, from the beginning to the end, Jesus told his people the last time in the book of Acts, chapter 1, I believe verse 4. He told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait in Jerusalem until they hear from him, until he sends the Holy Spirit. Very significant. That's the day we are celebrating today. And those disciples, everything was against them in Jerusalem. Everything. They were looking for them to kill them. They killed their master. They were looking for them to kill them, but that's where he sent them. He didn't send them to Capernaum in the north, where they could just be lost with the people, but he said, go back to the hostility. Go back to Jerusalem. There you will have power to be my witnesses. Those disciples took their feet one after the other, and obeyed their master and went actually back to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit came upon them. 
by their obedience, you and I are sitting here today. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to preach on that. I'll leave that to Pastor Brett to preach. That's not what I'm preaching today. I'm just warming up. <laughs> Our text today is Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. They came to Bethesda, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Amen. You guys, your amen <laughs> is, you're not sure whether you want to say amen or not. <laughs> and today we've been thinking about this carpet. I've been asked to limit my movements here. <laughs> so it's like a dog on a leash. <laughs> We've just read a text that describes us very significantly. This is a man that Jesus took so much time to get him to see. The healing of this man, Jesus has never handled that kind before. Normally, Jesus will just touch a man or a woman, and the person is healed. Not this one. They bring the man to Jesus. Jesus touches him. Nothing happens. Jesus holds his hand. Jesus by himself. He held the man's hand and walked him outside the village. Something very strange. After the village... Jesus spat into his eyes. Still, he didn't see. Wow. Then Jesus, scriptures, as I read, Jesus put two hands on this man's shoulders again. And then asked him, do you see now? And the man surprised Jesus, I believe, and everybody who is there, that yes, I see. But I see people like trees walking about. Trees with branches and all. I see people, but they are like trees walking around. What kind of sight is that? So Jesus holds him back and says, no, you are not seeing properly. And prayed for him again. And the man's eyes opened. And he could see clearly. Hallelujah. Now the faith. The Christian faith. The Christian faith. There are two things that we are dealing with here. It should not take Jesus. So much time. So much time. So much time. To cause us to be significant in this world. It shouldn't take Jesus too much time. Some of us have sat on these pews over and over and over and over again. We are not seeing. We are not seeing. 
And when we begin to see, we see people like trees walking around. You know, when, when people are trees, you can chop them down. When people are branches, you just yank it down. But if people are made in the name of Jesus Christ, people are made in the image of God. Everyone is made in the image of God. And Jesus wanted this man to see that people are not trees. People are not walking around like trees. The Jewish people are not trees. The Asian people are not trees. East Indians are not trees. Blacks are not trees. Irish people are not trees. They are made in the image of God. Hallelujah. If you're going to clap, you clap. If you won't clap, you don't clap. <laughs> people are made in the image of God. Amen. And before the, the, the assignment that has been given me today is to talk about racism. And I'm also looking at your, your clock. Ticking. <laughs> I asked pastor, they should have given me the whole day. You see, if we are going to make a significant change, if we are going to deal with poverty, if we are going to deal with child trafficking, if we are going to do anything, we have to recognize them as Adam's seed, Adam's ancestors. Jesus Christ died for them, every one of them. You begin looking at the poor people as trees, you begin looking at white people as trees, you begin looking at the Indians as trees. You begin looking at natives as trees. We cannot move. We will only lag behind. So do you see people as people? Do you see your wife as a person? Do you see your husband as a person? Some of you. The church. I happen to be here in people's church. But I'm talking about the church of God. You, I shouldn't be here. Because people's church, you have done significantly well. You've sent out. You've seen people as people. But just in case... You are sitting here this morning and your wife still looks like a tree that you can deal with her any way you want. Your husband is like a tree. You can deal with him any way you want. Some of your children are scared of you to stay. You're coming home, your child wants to live. They are simply scared of God's people. Godly mother, the children are scared of her. Godly father, the children are scared of her. Your wife can have good fellowship with you. What is the matter? You are seeing your wife as a tree? You go home from here and go and put your hand, that your hand. Go and put it over your wife. I say, you are no longer a tree. Put that hand over your husband and say you are no longer a tree because until you do that, you cannot deal with racism. Racism is a lot tougher. I'm, I'm bringing this home because, you know, we, we should be the people to handle some of these serious problems that we are facing with today. And Jesus did the work for us. God did the work for us. You know why? Because God said to us, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, God clearly said to you and me that we are the salt of the earth. We are. We are not being made the salt of the earth. 
God is not making you and I the salt of the earth. He said we have been made already. We have been made the salt of the earth. So that anywhere we go, we make the place palatable. We make the place livable. We've been made. We are the salt of the earth. But the salt, sometimes the church that God has been made a salt, sometimes create the problems. And sometimes simply doesn't know what to do. When you visit Ghana, there's a castle. They call it Elmina Castle. Underneath it is where the boats come. Who, who has been to Ghana before? Let me see your hand. Just be bold. One, two, three. They don't know. Everybody is scared. To answer my question. But when you go, thank you. When you go to Ghana or those who haven't been there, when you go, go to Elmina Castle. When you go to Elmina Castle, you will see that the castle is built in such a way that boats come under the castle. Boats come just beneath a church. A church is built on top of where the boats come to pick up the slaves. And that church, there's a, there's a, a, a scripture verse written on it. May God help us. There's a verse written on that little church. And the European man is sitting on it. And slaves are being moved under him. When you look at it, it tears your heart apart. That the church can do that. The church can use the Bible. Sitting and watching people dying in front of them, molesting them in front of them, and shipping them that many will be dying in the sea. They've been torn, first of all, from their people. The church has been part of what has happened to our indigenous people in the north. I was reading that before coming here. Our natives in the north, the church again young them from their, their, their mothers and fathers. Young them and try to take out their precious language away from them, to bury them, to take them. Because they were being looked at as trees. Trees and branches, they don't qualify to be people. Their language is bad. The color of their hair is bad. So they have to do anything they want to do with them that fits them. The church. My wife just told me this afternoon that, David, you know what? When you get excited like that, nobody hears you anymore. So we take these native kids, young them up, malfeed them, and they die, and their bodies shallow because they are not just complete human beings, they are trees. And the Lord tells that man, you can never tell people that I created that they look like trees walking about. Nobody walks about like a tree. You're natives. You hold the blood that God made when Jesus died for them. But the church always lags behind. Our saltiness is not seen. We need to understand that. That we have fumbled enough on this. So it's not just enough for David Mensah 
to be here and to be saying that I'm a Christian. I'm this, I'm that. Let me tell you something about myself. Before I came to Canada to study at the University of Toronto, I was the Scripture Union Secretary in Northern Ghana. I was the Scripture Union Secretary. But when my father died when I was a little kid, my uncle just did the most cruel things. I was, I, to my uncle's eyes, I was, I was even worse than a tree. He did everything to destroy me, and I had to escape from that man. I was sitting at the library of the university. Listen to this. I was a scripture union secretary. Really solid Christian, thought to myself. But I sat in the library one day and grieve. Grieve overwhelmed me. That how can my brothers, my father's brother, do that for me? And in that library, I actually asked God. I said, God, if you really are alive, the way I think you are alive, kill that man. Uh -huh. I was so angered, boiled with hatred. And I said, God, kill him. So I, I, know, your, I know some kind that we know text, we preach. But in our heart, there's no forgiveness. We are still asking, kill him. In that library, that very library, God spoke to my heart that when I kill your uncle, you'll be the next. <laughs> because when your dad died and you were going through all this, you were stealing. You became a thief. I reasoned a little bit and said, well, I stole to live. But he said, stealing is stealing. He dies, you will die. And that same library, I said, okay, don't kill him then. <laughs> we need to forgive everybody. We need, that's one of the medicines to the believers, to forgive so that we can move forward. Whoever has hurt you, forgive and you move forward. You know the church? This COVID, when it came, then suddenly things were going around and it became China, China COVID. I'm not, I'm not talking about politics here. I'm talking to God's children in this church. And our Asian sisters and brothers suddenly became confused, terrified, and some of them even covering their faces unnecessarily. I expected, I expected that when the COVID went away and your doors were opening, the churches of Canada, the doors were opening, the members of the churches, elders, will all line up to the street and every Asian that walked to the door, you hug them and said, come home. We don't consider you as a carrier of something. Come home. Toronto Star and three V's would have been coming to say, look at how God's children are welcoming their, their people home. But you were scared of them too. We we're probably scared. Some of our Jewish brothers, our Jewish sisters, can't walk. The, 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 the racism, the, the dimension it has taken is alarming. But remember, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. God has given us this saltiness to be able to deal with things that are going on. I'm going to show you a clip as I draw my, my message to a conclusion. I'm going to show you a clip 
of something that singing says we are one the blacks the whites the greens the blues all that God has made they are one and you know those people singing those songs these have been warlords these have been warlords there have been lots of ethnic conflicts in northern Ghana and this is part of the group a very big tension in this group. My wife and I, we made our mind that we will deal with people who have been ostracized. Today, there are 250 of them that we have reconciled together and that they are dealing peacefully with one another. We have not considered them as trees walking around. They are people that are walking around. We can do that in Christ's name because he salted us. Wherever we go when there's tension, we bring ease. God calls us to do that. When we surrender, like you are doing here, the Lord provides avenues. The thing we don't want to do is to go about like what we are seeing today. I told you I know the time is running. But quite often, the church will rather follow the world and go by the principles of the world. We don't seem to be able to find a consistent way to lead like going into a war zone when the world has failed to say this is what Christ presents. And you see people opening their eyes that Christ presents this. We need to provide avenues. We need to lead. Today the word, I, I come and I hear everywhere what the world is coining for us and we are all following it is tolerance. There's a word they call tolerance. Tolerance. Ah, then we are all involved with in tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Our word is not tolerance. We don't tolerate one another. We love one another. We love one another. <laughs> Jesus, when he was put on the cross and the nails were being put on his hands, that triggered divine anger. God was hurt that his son was being dealt with like this. It triggered vengeance. And Jesus quickly, on your behalf and on my behalf, cried quickly and said, Daddy, forgive them. Forgive David. Forgive Brett. Forgive Brenda. Forgive them. They don't know what we are doing. That's not tolerance. That's love. He loved us while he was being nailed. That's what you need to do. Don't follow the word tolerance. You look for somebody that somebody is neglected and you go for the person. Like I told you about your wife and husbands. We are not just simply to tolerate. We have to lead. We are the pathfinders. We are pathfinders. We create avenues for the world to follow. We don't follow what the world, the world is bankrupt of the real truth. You are made because you are the salt. We raise the bar for the world. They don't raise bars for us. Amen? Amen. We raise the bar for the world. the world follow us. We teach them. 
You come to Ghana, you see what we do. This year, we specifically look for people who people are calling trees. Very poor young boys and girls. And we pick them strategically from dangerous places where they have been ostracized. We picked 86 and we sent them to school this year that they will go and learn and come back and win bread. Poor women, we go into them where everybody thinks in that community they are worth nothing. We help them generate income. You go to Northern Ghana where I work, women have motor kings, you know them? Motor kings and making money. I'm going to close. I said that before, didn't I? <laughs> There's a monk. I want to complete with his story. In the fourth century, his name is Telemachus. In the fourth century, the Christian Rome, the Christian Rome was obsessed with the fights in the amphitheater, gladiators. That's what they entertained themselves with. Men who are born, men who have mothers and fathers, when the two men comes into the arena, one of them has to die. And then the Christian, Christian Constantinople, they cheer, hey, hey, hey. They've killed one another, they're entertainment. People, trees. And a poor monk, a tiny monk, came to Rome. And he thought he was going to Rome. He was going to the theater. He was going to watch these exotic games that are there. And when he went to his horror, two men, well, with javelins, one to die. And the monk, he went to them, the two of them, and said, in the name of Christ, please stop. In the name of Christ, please stop. And they won't listen. So as they hold their peers, he entered between the two men, and they pierced him to death. As his blood and other things were oozing down, somebody from the top of the arena, the very top, walked down all the way down, couldn't handle it, walked out. Somebody also from the other end walked down but couldn't handle it. The whole amphitheater emptied. And that was the end of the gladiators fight in Rome. Amen. Amen. Are you going to go out today and be Telemachus? Are you going to go out today and look at where it's hurting and you go between these people? Are you going to go out today and see a brother or a sister that is probably not your color or your color that you say, this one is not going to die. I'm going to be inside. I'm going to pick up. That's what God is asking us to do. By his grace, we've started doing that in Africa, in Ghana. We need to pick up and go between people who are suffering. Sometimes it might be getting the spear, but God in his kindness, will help us when we move with our hearts to show people. You know, when I went, the work that I've been doing, I haven't been going door to door and giving pamphlets to people to become Christians, door to door, door to door, door to door. I haven't been doing that. 
but I've started 48 churches. Because whenever you go between, whenever you, you protect people from slavery, anytime you protect, protect people from any of these dangerous, hurtful things about racism, anytime you do that, they ask you a question. And you say, I'm doing that in the name of the master, Jesus Christ. 48 churches have been built. Go in the power and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this Pentecost day, and be a person of salt, be a person that is leading by love, but, but by not tolerance. Don't tolerate love. The Lord be with you. Amen. I'm going to invite you to uh, close your eyes, bow your heads. And hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. The invitation of Jesus to be healed. Now I invite you to open your eyes. Open your eyes and look around. Look around at each other, please. Look around. What do you see? Who do you see? There's more, friends. Close your eyes again. Because there's still work to be done, as we have heard today. Jesus is inviting us to deeper healing, friends. To see more clearly. Each one of us have come here today hoping and expecting that the Holy Spirit would do something to bring healing, to make us more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. Find whatever it is, please, that is keeping us from being reconciled to you, to others. Heal our wounds that make it so very difficult to forgive. Humble our pride that makes it so very hard to hear. And open our eyes so that we can see others as you see them. And by the power of Jesus and his love within us, May we learn more and more what it means to love in a very, very hurting and broken world. We pray this to the Savior, to the Prince of Peace. Amen. Friends, <clears throat> There is uh, so much that we can learn from our brothers and sisters around the world. And we're so thankful, David, that you've taken the time to come today and teach us. If you are wanting to know David's story more, it's a powerful, powerful story. Um, his book is available in the Connection Center. Don't miss out on getting a copy of that. But there's more. We have two more Sundays and activities through the week. We don't want you to miss out on anything. So let's just watch this video and find out more about what lays ahead of us. Hello, church. I'm Fiona. 
and I'd love to share how we can engage in this year's Global Mission Conference. Today is the last day to register for Walk, Run and Roll, a fun-filled interactive 5K where we'll have the opportunity to learn from and support refugees. Next Sunday, Wissam Nisrallah is our guest and will inspire and challenge us. But don't just take my word for it. Here's Wissam. As many of you are experiencing, we live in a world of extreme polarization, both inside and outside the church. How can we experience and foster a culture and a practice of unity in the midst of extreme diversity? Hi, my name is Wissam Nasrallah. I am the COO of LSCSD, and I look forward to joining you at the Missions Conference early June, where we will be reflecting together on the theme of unity. I'll be sharing about a biblical model of unity through the words of Jesus in John 17 and building on our experience in the Middle East, a region of rich diversity, complex history, and intricate politics. I look forward to seeing you all there. For all conference details, visit thepeopleschurch.ca. See you next Sunday. Friends, I'm going to invite you to stand up. And as we go from this place today, we are going to be blessed by our brother Andrew, who has come all the way from Beirut, Lebanon. His ministry there is... Uh, Incredible what the Lord is doing through him to bring peace and healing to that place. So we thank you for coming and being with us. And Andrew, from everything that the Lord has done in him and through him, is going to pronounce a blessing on us. Thank you. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty. Come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. It says in Arabic, Arruh wal arus yaqulan ta'al. Wa man ya'tash fal yaqul ta'al. Wa man yurid fal ya'khuz ma'hayat majjanan. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you are wanting to stay and pray, please stay. One of our prayer team will join you. If you are wanting to talk and connect and get to know one another more, please head out. It's a beautiful day outside. Spend some time chatting with one another or head to our connection desk. Peace be with you.
Father